do is I'm going to uh, pray uh, because the Lord hears my prayers, so I don't have to worry about that. And I want to um, I want to get going as soon as possible. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would settle our hearts right now, settle our minds. Speak to us, Lord. We need your voice. We need your word. Um, God, this message has application for everyone hearing this. And my, my desire is that you would be glorified in this. My desire is that you um, would, would help us to be edified in you. God, speak mightily through me. I know that you will. Help me to get out of the way. Remove any distractions from outside of me, any distractions inside of me. For those of us who are hearing as well, um, I pray that you would remove any distractions outside of us, remove any distractions inside of us. We proclaim the death and resurrection of Christ over this message um, and every single um, scheme of the enemy to distract us with people, to distract us with things, to distract us with worries. We cast out all of those things in Jesus' mighty name, every single deception that the enemy wants to give us any offense that he wants to begin to sow in us. We just cast those things out. We rebuke the work of the enemy and we glorify you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read a lot of scripture right now because, um, yeah, I'm going to be jumping around. So I want you to get like a big pick, a big like gulp of, of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about being eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. I'll go into it more, but the, the place where we're going to focus on is 1 Corinthians 7, 6. We're going to go all the way down to 35. So bear with me as I read. If you have your word, you should have your word, or someone next to you should have a word. I want you to read alongside of me as I start in verse 6. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if I remain, if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord. That the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not divorce his wife. Then in verse 12, to the rest, I say, not the Lord. He's saying, I, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in any such case, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether, you're, you, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Then in verse 17, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not called to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while, he, while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. And then in 26, he says, I think then that it is good in view of the present distress 
that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life. And I am trying to spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened. So that from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none. And those who weep as though they did not weep. And those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. And those who buy as though they did, did not possess. And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is married is concerned about the things of the Lord. One who is unmarried, sorry, is concerned about the things of the Lord. How he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Now, that's a lot. It's a whole lot of scripture there. Um, I'm going to do my best to break this down. Holy Spirit's with us, so he's going to help me break it, and he's going to help us to receive it. Um, but this comes off the back of what we read last week, and that is this discourse between Jesus and his disciples. We, well, first, Jesus and the Pharisees, and then it becomes Jesus and his disciples. And he gives this, this, this grand picture of marriage where it talks about the commitment and the sacrifice in marriage. It talks about the calling of marriage, the, the one fleshness of marriage, the union of marriage, the, the, the lifelong commitment of marriage. And Jesus' disciples respond to him and they say, well, if, if this is what it's like to be married, it's probably better we shouldn't get married. And in Matthew 19, 11 and 12, Jesus respond, responds to them like this. He says, not all men can accept this statement but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. And what Jesus is doing is he's using this picture of singleness, and he's, he's liking it to being a eunuch. And if you know Eunuchs were people who, um, in those days, they had no sexual organs. They were either born that way um, or they were made that way, usually to serve like a king. Um, they, or, or sometimes it was a consequence of, of some type of crime. Um, and they were made eunuchs, either they, as punishment or they were serving a king. And they, they, the king was using that method to, to secure undistracted devotion. But here Jesus says... A life of singleness is likened to someone who has made themselves a eunuch and not just out of like trying to be overly passionate, but they do it for the sake of the kingdom. But first, let's remember something. Let's do a quick little recap that when we're talking about this, this eunuch life, whether it is marriage or the eunuch life of singleness, we're talking about calling. This eunuch life is something that should be accepted, but should only be accepted by those who it is given. That's why Jesus says, but when he starts his statement out, he says, not all men can accept the statement, only those to whom it has been given. In our text today, we see in verses six and seven, when, when, when Paul begins to speak, he says, he says, I say this, by way of concession, not a command. That's important for us to understand. There is no biblical command in scripture to be single or to be married. Yet he says in verse seven, each man has his own gift from God. One in this manner, one in that. When we think about singleness and, and when we think about marriage, the first thing and the foundation of all things is, has God given me a gift and which gift is mine? And they are both gifts. If you're watching this and your marriage is, 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 is troubling and you're having a hard time, don't let any of that distract you from the fact that biblically your marriage is a gift. 
And if you're watching this and you're single and you're longing for a spouse and you're not satisfied, don't be distracted by all that to, to, to think that your singleness is not a gift because it is. And it's a calling. And it's important for us to understand this. I'm not going to go back into it, but we have to remember that calling is important because calling outlasts preference. And most of us, when we're looking for mates, we're looking for, for people who satisfy our preference. The problem with that is if you're called to marriage for life, those pref your preferences are going to change and that person is going to change. My wife and I and my son, we went, um, <laughs> went on a vacation uh, recently. It was our first, first family vacation. And <laughs> one of the things we did, we... we um, we tested to see how well I could do under stress by going canoeing. And if you know something about me, you know that I am the furthest person away from a canoeer. Never, never in my life would I ever have considered that I would even be in a canoe. It was terrifying. It was something that I was not ready for. It was just mind blowing. Let me just say this. I'm called to my wife. And from the moment I met her, I knew that, I, that she was my wife and, and not from a moment, shortly after, and I was always going to be called to her. I knew that. But in the making of these decisions, not once nine years ago did my wife ever mention canoeing. She never mentioned outdoor stuff. She never mentioned camping. In those, in those times, that was not a part of the pro, that was not part of her dating profile. She never mentioned those things. As nine years has progressed, her preferences have changed and my calling to serve her and to love her in how she needs to be loved has changed. I promise you this. If I was being led by my preferences, I would be probably upset because I'm not an outdoors person and now we're doing outdoor stuff. But yet my calling is to my wife. It's not to my preference. That's the, that's the beauty of calling. Calling means service. Paul uses the example, and we, and we went through this last time. Don't worry for you guys who are uncomfortable. I'm not going to go deep into it again, but, but Paul uses the example of sex in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, the, we, we, we remember this in 3, 4, and 5. He says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, talking about sex. Likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not, and here's where it is. The wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. And the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. Paul uses the example of marriage and sex and marriage as, as it no longer being something that, that is, is there for your own personal gratification, but it's now something that serves the needs of your spouse. What he's saying is, for those who are married and called to be married, your body is no longer your own. And if your body is no longer your own, neither is your time Neither is your energy, neither is your money. So when we understand singleness and we understand marriage and the calling to marriage, when we have a desire for marriage, we have to understand that we, our desire must be shaped in a biblical view and a biblical foundation of marriage, and that is service. So how do we know if we're called to marriage? Paul helps us helps to give discernment in verses 8 and 9. I'm saying in 1 Corinthians 7 this entire time. In verse 8 and 9, he says this, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. He's saying, I'm single. I think it's good that you remain like me. But then listen to what he says in verse 9. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. This is probably one of the most unromantic views of marriage from what it seems like. But keep in mind, the context is Paul is using this example, talking about sex. Marriage is more than that, but he's, it's, you're inside of, a, of, a, of, a, of one thought. And he's saying it's better than you, for you to be married than to burn with passion. In that, in that little bitty verse, we see one of the ways that we should view our calling to marriage. Married, people who are called to married, most likely are going to have a leaning in a marriage direction. Here's what I mean. Do you desire companionship? Kids, sex, you may be called to marriage. Now, here's the thing. 
So many people, I believe, are called to marriage that it's almost crazy for us to think that these people exist. But the people do exist. I do know people who don't struggle with these passions. I do know people who don't have a desire for companionship, who don't want kids. And honestly, in the church, these people often can be condemned. But here's the thing. If you don't have these desires or if these desires aren't strong, if they're not burning in you, you may be called to singleness. But first and foremost, when we view these things, we shouldn't view them based on, am I call, do I have these desires so I must be married? We have to view it from calling, of course. So if you're brought into marriage for any other reason, any of those reasons, if those are your first, like you want to be married because you want a companion, you want to be married because you want kids, you want a family, you may want to rethink if it's a calling or if it's just a strong desire. Because if you were called to marriage, you're not called to this, this, this picture perfect family life and family living. You're not called to some expensive fairy tale wedding. You're not called to some picture that you may see on Lifetime. You may be looking during, during the holidays and you see all, the, all the, the, the married pictures of the families in front of the trees and everybody's got the matching pajamas and it's all the same pajamas for everybody got the same pajamas at Target. It's weird. But you, you may see that and you, see, and you may be like, oh, I, I think I'm called. That's, that's great. But you're not, first and foremost, you're not called to those desires. You're not called to a vibe. You're not called to a culture. You are called to give your life to a person in service and sacrifice. Is that your foundation when you're saying I'm called? I like a lot of food, but it doesn't mean I'm called to eat it. You may like a lot of things about marriage, but it doesn't mean that you're called to it. Your foundation of calling is, am I called to give my life to this person? The value in the marriage is not in the marriage itself. It's in the calling of the marriage. And if, if the value is in the calling of the marriage, then there's value in the calling of a single person. Both are equal in the kingdom. But to be clear, in this passage, Paul is advocating that those who are single stay that way. He's pushing for the challenge of Jesus in Matthew 19, that you would consider making yourself a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. And that is a message that we need to hear because it's so, it's so stark. It's, it's one of the most countercultural messages that you see in scripture. And we don't often hear it. When's the last time you hear, you, you've heard a pastor advocating for you, Hey, make yourself a eunuch, stay single for the sake of the kingdom. And it's, and, and it's because in this culture, we have an idolized and unhealthy view of marriage. And you know how you can tell that? Think about the person that you know that's 35 or 40 or 45 and they're unmarried. Nine times out of 10, that person is viewed with, oh man, that's sad. Or there must be something wrong with them. And it's because we idolize marriage. But here, Paul is actually fighting for, for singleness. Why? That's the question. Why is Paul hating? <laughs> Why is Paul hating on marriage? And I don't think that he is. When we skip all the way down to verse 32 and 34, this is what he tells us. He says, I want you to be free from concern. One who is married is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married, or I'm sorry, unmarried, but one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife and his interests are divided. He says the same thing about the woman. The woman who's unmarried is considered is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and spirit. And the one who is who is married is concerned about the things of the world and how she may please her husband. See, in marriage, along with this becoming one flesh, Along with this serving your spouse comes the temptation to make that spouse an idol. There's a temptation for us to focus completely on our family. Life becomes about how do we make our family the best family as it can be, rather than 
how do I become the best disciple and make my family the best disciples? It's very tough. So, in, in, and I think most of the people that, that, that attend, the, like, attend the fellowship who are watching, I don't think that we're particularly, most of us, I don't think we're turned that way. But we have, to, we have to understand, even in your singleness, to prepare yourself. Because if you are called to marriage, understand that there is a temptation to make your life about your wife or your husband or about your kids or about your family as a whole. And how do I make this, this earthly kingdom of family better and better? And we can do, and we can sometimes forsake the kingdom for the sake of that. But it's not just the bad heart, even in the goodness. Because here's the thing. Paul says, Paul says that the concern of a husband or a wife is to please their spouse. The problem with that is a spouse is called to please their spouse. He just went through talking about giving your body to please your spouse. So when God says that the desire of a wife is to please her husband, he's not, he's not really saying that that in and of itself is a bad thing. As a married person, your spouse's need is your need. It's, it's one of the reasons why he starts off talking about sex. He's saying, okay, you're no longer to think of yourself as your own, your need. So it's not just sex. It's if your wife is hungry, you're hungry. Not, not, not literally, but you are supposed to act towards your spouse as if it was you. So if your spouse is sick, you don't just live a life of unsickness. You take, you take part of that. You take care of them, which means your life is altered because your spouse's life is altered. It means that even in marriage, in, in marriages that seek the kingdom, here's the thing. You will sometimes be called to serve the person that you're called to. You're always called, but... When you are called, that is a singular mission of the kingdom that won't always satisfy the larger mission, but it's still a part of the will and the mission of God. Here's what I mean. So as a, as a husband in 1 Timothy, Paul says, he says this, he says that if a man cannot provide for his family, he is worse than an unbeliever and has denied the faith. So as a man with a family, I can go out evangelizing, I can go make disciples, but if I neglect the singular calling to provide for my family, it may seem like a great work for the larger work of the kingdom, but it's neglecting the singular work of the kingdom in my family. And I'm no longer serving those who God has called me to serve. And it doesn't mean, here's the thing, and this is what's difficult. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's, it's a question of being led by the spirit. Because just like in my singleness, there are times that I would suffer. I would put away my needs for the sake of others. There are times that as a husband, my family suffers for the sake of the kingdom. But there are some times where the people in the church will suffer for the sake of the kingdom in my family. That's why Paul, when he's when he's 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 going through this, he says like, "This is this is tough." He says in uh, what what verse is it? He says in verse thirty four. He says his interests are divided, and it's not always like we we can't hear that and say, "Oh, well, it's it's divided between good and bad." No, it's divided between calling. I know that I know that like so here's how I think I know that the Lord has given one husband to Darcy so I that is my primary calling because she has no other husband everybody else has other people to evangelize other people to disciple them um, you can find another pastor so I know that I have that one calling however God has called me to this church which means he's called me to his people so when do I know when am I, okay when is this a time to prioritize I only have 24 hours when do I prioritize the church or evangelizing, or discipleship, or when do I prioritize caring for my wife? And, and, and that's a tough thing. And it's easy, depending on which side you lean, you're going to lean one side. Like if, like if you're single and you're after the kingdom, you're always going to lean towards the kingdom. If, if, if you're married and you, lean to, and you, and you, you have a high view of marriage, you're always going to lean towards the marriage. But that's your leaning. Calling is completely different. There have been times where I've had to leave my sick wife under her blessing, under her calling to, to advance the kingdom as well. I've left my sick wife to go and serve the kingdom. And there's times where it's been the opposite. 
I've, I've left kingdom work simply because the Lord said very clearly, you just need to go home and spend time with your family. As a married man, my interests are divided. And it's not between good and bad. It's between calling and calling. That's the tough part. But here's the thing. Eunuchs, eunuchs don't have this issue or have to fight this fight. Those who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, they've been called to do so. And that means putting an end to their desires and their needs that are fulfilled in marriage. But it also means that eunuchs for the kingdom have put to death the potential for this division, this distraction, this, this dividedness and focus. And that's what Paul is getting at. This is the heart of both Paul and Jesus' statement talking about eunuchs. This is their heart of their statements that are pro-singleness. In verse 35, he says, This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Let me tell you this. I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, if you are undistractedly devoted to the Lord and you are called to marriage, your, your marriage will completely arrest your focus. When I met my wife, I was after it. I was, I was making disciples, evangelizing. Everything that I was doing was for the sake of the kingdom. I worked just enough to pay my rent. And after that, it was everything was the kingdom. But when God called me, it came like a lightning bolt into my life. It was so clear. And this is why I want to encourage those who are single and think they may be called. Focus on your devotion to the Lord. These things aren't written to deprive us or to rebuke us uh, for, for being married or for wanting to be married. They are written for the sake of serving God. Step out of your view for a second. Step out of your marriage, step out of your singleness, and remember that first and foremost, you are a child of God, and you are a disciple of Christ, and your first priority is advancing the kingdom. When you are married, you spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with someone you are called to serve. If you don't enter marriage with the right foundation and with the right heart, it can be easy for the spouse to occupy the place that God is supposed to. It's almost normal and natural. But here's the thing, if you are not married and if you're dating people, I want to take this moment to, for you to, to give serious thought to either who you're dating or who you're thinking about dating. Because if you're dating people who don't have this devotion to God and, and, and they don't, their love for God and their desire for advancing the kingdom is, is subpar, you are setting yourself up to be distracted. You are setting yourself up to lose your devotion. I, let me tell you this now. I've seen it over and over and over and over and over again. People start a dating ministry, and this is what I mean. They start dating someone who is either not a believer or they're barely a believer or they're probably not a believer or maybe they're a believer. They're not quite sure or they're a believer, but they don't look like it. And, and devoted disciples of Christ, they, they join themselves with these people saying, well, okay. You know, I just got to, you know, I'm going to disciple them. <laughs> Listen, you are called to disciple in marriage. But up until that point, <laughs> that person should already be a disciple. I'm going to help them. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to date them to Christ. This is what I can tell you. It almost never works. Matter of fact, I can say it never works. I have never once seen it. And now in my 36th year of living, as I've seen friends and friends and friends and friends and friends and friends and friends, and friends get divorced, I can tell you that those who, who date with a desire to bring that person who is, who is unzealous to the Lord into zeal, often it ends in bad marriages or divorce. I've seen many a called women and men pulled from advancing the kingdom to advance the American dream. Their foundation becomes advancing their own security, advancing their family, and then the Great Commission is now an add-on to their mission of health, wealth, and family. 
rather than the kingdom remaining the foundation and the marriage and the family becoming a tool in the hand of God for greater fruitfulness on the mission field. That's what marriage should be. If you're called to marry, but right now in your singleness, you are living a life that is sold out for Christ. If you find a mate that is sold out for Christ, when you guys come become one, there will be greater fruitfulness. Not to mention, if you're going down this road, trying to date passion into your boyfriend or girlfriend, know that if your passion for Christ does remain, it's going to affect your marriage. I've seen this huh? and, and like so specific, I won't, I've seen it. I've seen guys who were passionate. Like we, we were, I was out advancing the kingdom with them. They get married. They disappear. Next time I see them, they're like, they're trying to like climb the corporate ladder. And I'm looking at them like, bro, you're not even a corporate guy. You see the fire leave their eyes. If you remain passionate though, and your spouse is not passionate, how can you guys even have union if you don't even have the same foundation? I was reading this in my own reading the other day where uh, David, King David was bringing back the, the Ark of the Covenant um, into, to, um, into Jerusalem and he's dancing. He's dancing because he's so excited. Like he brings back the Ark of God. He's so excited. And it says that his wife, this is a biggie. He said that his wife looked out and saw him dancing. And it says that she despised him, which means she, like the word literally means she thought low of him. She thought less of him. And he came in and he said, look, at, look, at, she said, look, at, I'm paraphrasing. Look at you. You're the, you're the king. Look at the king of Israel making a fool of himself. David replies, I have undignified myself and I will become even more undignified. Why? Because the Lord is worth it. But it says that after that, it says that in re response to that, the Lord made her barren. She couldn't get, she couldn't have kids anymore. That didn't just, that didn't just affect her. That affected David and his lineage. You, the last place you want to be is put yourself in a marriage where you are passionate about the Lord and, and that person is not. The more passionate you become, the more they will despise you. It's like speaking diff different languages. So in light of all this, let's go back to married people for a second. So is God looking at married people and saying, huh, you made a mistake. <laughs> what are you doing? You messed up. <laughs> but that's not his response. When we go back to verse 10, this is what he says. He says to the married, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. If she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not divorce his wife. And then in 12 through 16, he, he even talks about if you, are, if you are married to an unbeliever, you're supposed to stay with them. Then in 17, he says, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. Let me say this to you. God hasn't made a mistake. If you are seeking the Lord, if you are in obedience to the best of your knowledge, even if you weren't and you now are, if you're in his word and you're praying and you're with his people, you can rest in knowing that you are right where God wants you to be. I'm not saying if you're in rebellion, I'm saying if you're following, you're humble, you're following the Lord, you're seeking, you are right where he wants you to be. We know later on in scripture that God does not want us to marry unbelievers. We know that. We see it all throughout scripture. But yet here, Paul is saying in verses 12 through 16, hey, if you've married an unbeliever, I want you to honor that because that is the place where you are at now. Stay there. Remain there. And I want to say the same thing to you singles. Even if you're called to marriage, you're not married right now. Remain where he has called you now until he calls you elsewhere. And so it is with all of the church. This is what Paul continues to say in, 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 in verse 18. He says, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to be uncircumcised. That sounds ridiculous. Someone who, who, who they were circumcised and then they become a, a Christian and all of a sudden they have to get uncircumcised. <laughs> he says, no, don't do that. He says, circumcision in verse 19, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. 
What matters is the keeping of the commandments. Each man must remain in the condition in which he called. And this is what I want to say to you right now, whether you are, whether you're trying to figure out if you're called to singleness or you're called to marriage, whether you're single or married, understand this, that you are already called in your current state now. Callings change and you may be called to marriage one day, but, or you're, yeah. You may be called to marriage one day, but the one thing that you know is that right now you are called to singleness. You know how I know? Because you're single. That means that you are already, whether you've decided to make the decision or not, you're already a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. <laughs> but here's the problem. If you're a eunuch, and, you, and whether you want to be or not, and your foundation is anything other than the kingdom, then you have to make the choice for your uniqueness to be for the sake of the kingdom or to be for coveting a different calling. And this is what trips most people up. This is what trips people up who are single and this is what trips people up who are married. The dissatisfaction with your current calling. I've seen it in married people. Married people can desire a life outside of the one that they've been given. And then, and you see this, this is one of the, the when, I, when I talk to people who I know who have left their marriage, who, 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 have, who have committed adultery, this is how it happens. There is a desire for something other than their marriage. It's not always sex. It's just the desire to be outside of the place where God has called them. The marriage has begun, become difficult or life has become difficult and the marriage is not providing the thing that it needs to provide. It becomes difficult and the marriage is no longer a place that meets their needs. They leave despite their calling to serve their spouse unto death. And there's no difference in singleness. Because we're not really eunuchs, like we don't actually have to cut our organs off. We're not really eunuchs when single. When that life becomes hard, you can begin to bend your convictions and your morals to go towards the place that you want to go. It's what Darcy and I call playing house. You begin to play house, not because you're called, but because you're lonely. Not because you're called, but because your sexual desires are too much to take. You begin to forsake your current calling, not because God has called you to marriage, but because the life of a eunuch is not satisfying your needs and desires. And it's in this that the Apostle Paul says, says this. This is, this is the comfort that he gives. Listen to this. Were you called while a slave? If you're a believer in Christ, you're called, period. You're being of use. You're not waiting for anything. You were called. He says, but when you were called, were you called as a slave? Listen to this. He says, do not worry about it. Whoa. Whoa. Let me just tell you, this verse has actually been used to promote slavery back in the day. Like, hey, the Bible says it's okay. But then, let's be clear, he does say this, but if you are able to become free, rather do that. But then he says this, what's he saying in 22? He says, he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. He's saying that even in the midst of, of, of your slavery, you are free in Christ. Now, don't go from one end to the other. He's not. He just said, if you can get free, get free. He's not promoting slavery, but he's making a, a larger point. You have a freedom that is outside of your current state. And I say the same thing to you. If you are single, there's a freedom. There's a freeness that you have even in your desire for a spouse. And it's, it's connected to your calling to God, not to your calling to marriage. What? Let, oh Lord, let our, I want our fellowship not to be people who get married out of their thirst. I want people who are already fulfilled, marrying people who are already fulfilled so they can be a part of helping God fulfill this world. But then and he says this, and later in 22, he says, likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. He says, so yeah. You're free, but you're also called to God, which means you're a disciple. You have the freedom of a son, but you have the calling of a disciple. Some of you guys who are watching this, who are married, you, you think you want to be free 
from your marriage because it's tough or maybe you got married and you decide, hey, I just don't like this person anymore. But guess what? If the Lord was to free you from that marriage, you're still called. He's still going to put you in places where you were called to sacrifice your own desires and your wants and your needs and serve someone else. You're still Christ's slave. He says, 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Now, we know for a fact he's not talking about, he just talked about getting married, so he's not saying forever, but he's talking about being satisfied, staying where you're at, living as if this is going to be the rest of my life. My question to you, for, for you who, who, are, who are not married, what are you exactly waiting for? Marriage is dope, but the one relationship that matters eternally is already yours in Christ. You have your completeness in Christ. You should not be looking for marriage for someone to come and complete you. You are already made complete. And if you don't feel that, then the problem is not that you are single. The problem is you don't understand your inheritance. You don't understand the kingdom. You don't understand what you have. If you're waiting for someone to come and save you on a white horse, there is one king on a white horse and we just read about him in Revelation and you should seek your desire and your relationship with him. I've decided in this moment next week, I'm going to go into marriage and, and talk about how these things work. I wasn't going to do it before because most people in our fellowship aren't married, but I think it's going to be good for us. Hey, boo. Sorry, I'm at home. This lady's over here looking at me. <laughs> but I'm going to go through marriage because I think it's important. So that'll be the last talk on this. I just decided that now. But here's the thing. I want you, us to understand this, that there is no person on this earth that you need to complete you. You should understand that in singleness, but man, oh man, do married people need to understand this. If you are married and you are watching this and the person that you are married to is constantly going under your desires, they don't, they don't measure up, understand something. That person was never there for, to complete you. That is not their job. When you are married, your job, the only job is to serve the other person and you're not thinking about their job towards you. When I get to meet, when I get to meet the father, he's not going to be like, yo, so tell me how Darcy do. He's going to take into account how I was as a husband, how she is, how she serves me. That's between her and the Lord. And if I'm focused on what that, what, what my spouse is not doing, I can't be, I can't be focused on what I'm supposed to be doing as a husband. That's why in verse 28, he says this. I think that in this good, I think that this is good. This is a good thing what he's saying in view of the present distress. Listen to this. That it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Why is he saying this? He says, guys, however you're called, God is good. The kingdom is unchanged. Whether you stay single, whether you get married, the kingdom is unchanged. The commission, the, the great commission does not change. Like they understand, like keep in mind what's being said. This is like big stuff. Like to say, like they understand the depth of saying, hey, hey, you, you're never going to get married again. Like Jesus could have chose any. He could have just said if some people stay single, but he chooses eunuch. He understands how deep that sounds. Listen, when Paul says it's good for widows not to remarry, understand in that culture, widow was a place of shame. They understand the depth of what they're saying, but they're saying these things are deep. These things are hard. They're jarring to hear. But I'm saying this because what I'm telling you here is light in light of the kingdom. They both considered that following Jesus and seeking his kingdom was more important. So the real question is not, should I date? Not am I called to marriage? Am I seeking the kingdom? That's the question. The kingdom of God should remain our priority, even above our desire to marriage. And guys, I want to encourage you, especially, well, I don't even want to say especially single, single and married people. I want to encourage you that when Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom of God, that's not just the direction. It's a direction. And then there's a promise. All these things will be added. And in the context of that, he's talking about provision. He's not talking about specifics. 
So, for example, if you're, if he said, he says, hey, I'm, you, you, food, place to stay, that's going to be provided, but it may not be the food you want. It may, it may not be the, the place you want to live in, but you know what it is? It, you're going to get food. You're going to get shelter. And I think it's the same when we talk about marriage, when we talk about singleness, that if you seek first the kingdom, those desires that you have, if you're single, those desires for companionship, all those things, they will be added to you. It may not look how you think. It may not be in marriage. May, what if it's just Christ? The more and more I read, I'm blown away by the relationship I see in scripture that, that, that Paul has. And a lot of that is probably due to his affliction, affliction that he had because it was just him. Paul sought first the kingdom and those things were added. That means that whether married or single, you're called to seek first the kingdom in your present calling and place your needs and your desires in the hands of God. We are disciples, but we're also his children. Like we're also his children. We're also his children. And that means that he sees and he cares about your struggles in this area. God sees your loneliness and he's and he sees your longing. He sees your cares. Whether you're single or married, if you're single and you have desires that you can't get because you're not because you're not married or if you're married and you have desires that aren't being taken care of. But guess what? God sees it. And isn't it sweet that God tells us in Psalm 147 or 147 verse three that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds? In Psalm 34, 18, he says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. There's no symbolism in that. Like, literally, your heart is broken. God heals you. He takes care of you. He's saying that he cares for your heart. Cast your cares on him. Not, not for the answer in a person but for the answer and God's ability to sustain you. That's, that's where it's at. Because if you're single and you think that and you're lonely now and you're, and you're praying and you're asking God for, for companionship and you're expecting that to be fulfilled in a person when you get married, if that person doesn't match to, to, to what you need them to be, you're going to find yourself lonely just like you were when you were single. But if you're if you're single and you want to be and you and you want a marriage, but you want God just to help you not be lonely and you set your sight in him when you get married and your spouse doesn't measure up to what you need them to be. You still have God. So you still remain unlonely. And this is where we end at the crux of all scripture here. What I'm getting ready to read is the challenge of all scripture. You've heard me read about it over and over, and you're going to continue to hear it because this is the push of the New Testament. Question is, how do we live as eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom? Paul responds in verse 28. He says, if you marry, you have not sinned. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life. I'm trying to spare you. You've heard that. Then in 29, he says this. This I say, brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none. And those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as they did not rejoice. Those who buy, talking about people who have money, as though they did not possess. Those who use this world, he's talking about career. He's talking about ambitious people. Those who, those who use this world as though they did not make full use of it. Why? For the form of this world is passing away. What is he saying? He's saying that whatever state you were called into, even if it's for your whole, whole life, it's only momentary. Don't begin to live your life as if the things that you are doing now are eternal. We get eternal rewards based on how well we serve in those things. But your singleness is not eternal. Your marriage is not eternal. Your singleness will end with your union to Christ. Your marriage will end and you will be united to Christ. Again, we've seen the same thing we see over and over in Scripture, that our hope should be set 
on the world to come. That's why he says, if you're married, don't, don't live as if you have a spouse. Now, obviously, Paul is the same one that talks high about spouse. When you, when you read Ephesians 5, he cares about how a wife is and how a husband is. He's not saying to, to just go and live your life as if you're single. That would actually go against what he's saying in Scripture, what against Jesus said in Matthew 19. What he's saying is to live with this foundation of the kingdom. You may not be a eunuch. God bless you. You have favor because of it. You have, in my opinion, you have a one-up because you have a spouse, but at your heart level, you should live as a eunuch, giving up your hopes and your desires for the sake of the kingdom. Even, this is what's so dope about marriage. I'm talking about this later. Even, God calls me to do that, but guess what? I still get to be married, which means I get companionship. I get the benefits of marriage. Despite, at my heart level, I'm supposed to still be called as a eunuch. I'm supposed to still think that way. And this is such a beautiful thing in marriage because when your spouse is, is not everything you need them to be, you're still supposed to live like single and now you're supposed to serve them. Singleness may be a burden to you. Marriage may be a burden to you. But if it's where God has called you, serve in it for the sake of the kingdom with your eyes set on the world to come. Listen, don't waste your calling wishing that you had another. If God has called you to singleness now, take full advantage of it. Serve him with everything that you have, leaving your needs and your desires at his feet. Can I just say something very quickly? If you are single, especially if you are single in our church, you have the opportunity to undividedly give Christ everything that you have in action, not just in your heart. In action, which means you can go to any place at any time. This is one of the things that frustrates me. I'll just be honest with you. So many people that I meet now that are single, it's like, bruh, I'm, I'm married with a kid and a dog. He just got a dog. I like him. <laughs> I'm, I'm married. I, I, I work 40 hours a week. I have a church. I, I have a wife. I have a son. I, I, I'm, I have other, other priorities that I'm trying to do. There is no reason in the world as a single man I should be outworking you in the kingdom. That's insane. And I'm not talking about a competition. I'm talking about what is seeking the kingdom look like? What is making disciples look like? You're called to a great commission. Why should I make more disciples than you? You have more time. It seems like this current generation is so much better at going to things than they are advancing the kingdom. And you're wasting your singleness. You're wasting it. Give it up. For the sake of God, advance the kingdom, make disciples, do the things that are scary now because there will come a time where you may not have the time to, where you will be called to sit down and stay focused on a few people for the sake of the kingdom. Right now, you can give it everything. I remember going to a church and I remember the pastors at the church, man, like he had like a, like a job job, like, like not 40 hours. He was like 80 hours a week. He was working working crazy. He had like three or four houses where they were housing people. Um, he, so he's running this, his wife is running this thing, like all these things. Then they had a church. And then when I would talk to them, like they were constantly discipling people. And I'm looking at people in the church, like, wait, why is he out working everybody? The guy who has the full schedule in your singleness, this can be you. This is the time to work. And I'm going to talk about this next week, but the, the better disciple you are now, the better spouse you will make then. The worst thing that can happen to you is you first start making disciples when you get married. Or you first start to learn how to give your life away when you get married. Do it now. If God has called you to marriage, serve him in your marriage as you lay down your life for your spouse. Leaving your needs and your desires at his feet. Don't be fooled to think that your desire for the kingdom is somehow greater than your marriage. And the problem with that is God knows how to work it together. He knows how, how to make it so you can serve your family and at the same time serve the kingdom. But you'll never hear from him if your root and your desire is not to work for God with everything you have in the calling of marriage that you have now. When this world passes away, so will your marriage and so will your singleness. You will forever be satisfied, not in an imperfect person, but in a perfect savior. Until he comes, 
you can begin serving him now. So having said that, let me pray for us. And I want to encourage you guys, like, this is a time to really seek after the Lord together um, as a church. You guys know some of us are meeting together in houses. And um, this is a time where I would encourage you to pray. One of the things that um, we've changed some things in our schedule. So prayer nights are kind of interrupted. And I think it's the Lord's, the Lord's will, not because he doesn't want us to pray, but because he wants us to do what we're doing on Wednesday. But we have the opportunity to pray together every Sunday now um, in smaller groups. So I would encourage you to not end your time of worship now, not in your time of ministry now, but to continue in and seeking after the Lord on these things. Let me pray for us and then I'll throw it back to the people who are leading in the homes. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that every single week when I come up here to talk, I don't have to think about my own thoughts or my own opinions. Lord, you've written it down for us. You've told us your mind. Um, and I thank you for that, God. I pray that like every single week, you would make us good ground so we would receive what you have for us and it will cause us to bear fruit. Love you, Lord. Um, help us to, to remain in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. You were good to me before I knew your name. Your grace freed me from a selfish pain. I was lost and I felt the need, the need for you.